Bears. Powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. Now, live from inside the Matt Black Kia Studios, it's Football at Four. Football Friday edition of Football at Four, powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. Josh Hennig, filling in for Mike Gill on a Friday edition of the show. And as we said, joining us as he does each every Friday, Andrew Ducheco. Eagles final preseason game is tonight. We are days away from them having to get down to the first 53 of the 2021 NFL season. So to dive more into tonight and Tuesday with us right now is Andrew Ducheco for Football and Four, powered by the Inside the Birds podcast at a Ducheco NFL on Twitter. Give him a follow there. Andrew, how you doing this Friday? Hey, Josh, I'm doing well. How you doing? I'm doing pretty good. You know, listen, I, I'm I'm excited tomorrow is college football, but we still got to get through today because, listen, the tonight we might not see any starters as all the reports are out there, but there are still roster spots on the line. So uh, before I get into the details of that, I want to ask you about, you know, one of the speculations out there is that part of the reason why the Eagles are not playing any starters tonight is because – they have to play the Jets this upcoming season. And if the Eagles don't want to show them anything, do you buy that at all? Well, they play them, what, in December? I believe it's December 13th or week 13 or something to that effect. I mean, um, I'm not sure how much they're going to be able to gauge from the fourth preseason game. You don't really show anything in the preseason anyway. I think it's more of a way to preserve the starters. I mean, the weather is not going to be great tonight, so why risk injury? Uh, obviously there's going to be a, a lot of rain in that area. So um, I, I don't, you don't usually play starters anyway in the final preseason game. Uh, you can make an argument that some players could use the extra work, but with the season two weeks away, why risk it uh, in this scenario? I, I don't know that, that it would matter one way or the other. Um, if they're playing them, I don't know that it would matter if they're playing them for the opener. You're not going to show anything in the fourth preseason game or the third preseason game. That's the other aspect of this, Andrew, is, you know, the, the, I talked with about, um, you know, Jeff about this about a week ago, but about the fact that you think about the fact that you have the final preseason game tonight, then you have the roster cutdowns on Tuesday, but you still have another, what, 10 days before the start mm-hmm. of the NFL season. So this whole schedule takes a lot of getting used to, and I'm going to have to see how teams like the Eagles play this out because we know the first 53 is not the 53 that plays on the first week of the season. Right, yeah, that's the fluid 53, as, as they call it. Usually, I mean, you have to reach a uh, 53-man roster limit by 4 o'clock on that day, but obviously then there's the, the waivers that follow, and you know, teams are usually put in claims that they want. If they see if there's an area to upgrade, um, you could look at wide receiver, defensive tackle, possibly linebacker for depth uh, that the Eagles could look at. But, you know, a lot of teams do that. So, they, yeah, they have to reach a certain limit. Um, <clears throat> but then there's always that uh, – those new wrinkles that are sometimes tossed in there. I believe in 2016 that, for example, they grabbed three different guys. It was Bryce Treggs, Camille Grugier, Hill, and Terrence Brooks. So, I mean, it does, uh, it, does, it does happen. Now, with tonight's game, obviously there are some guys who are definitely still playing for roster spots. And you highlight over at InsideTheBirds.com the situation with – Travis Fulgham and J.J. Ortega-Whiteside, you know, two players that came in with completely different set of expectations. And now, moving forward, Andrew, you kind of have to wonder, you know, who exactly does the team decide to go with? Because we know that the Eagles place a lot of value on these joint practices. So you have to wonder how much what happens tonight. Is it is it really going to swing them or does it confirm what they already thought? Like, this is going to be a very fascinating you know, tug and pull when it comes to these two wideouts. Yeah, well, to be honest with you, I'm not sure that this final game is going to sway them one way or the other. I feel like they're entering this game with an idea of, of how they envision that wide receiver position based on what they've seen in game action and what they've seen throughout the summer. Now, do I think Travis Fulgham has the most upside when you're looking at him compared to J.J. Ortega Whiteside and John Hightower. But again, he had that five weeks that five-week surge in the midseason last year, and it was very remarkable in, in the way that he that he did it. It sort of emerged out of nowhere, but he sort of faded to the background. Obviously, the return of Alshon Jeffrey and certain variables contributed to that, but 
then you wanted to see you had a you had a, a golden opportunity this summer to become one of the top three receivers, put your stamp on that role. It really hasn't materialized in that way. He got sort of leapfrogged in the pecking order by Quez Watkins. Greg Woolwich still there as a competent slot receiver, sure handed guy, you know, what you have there. So it really, they lack a, a, a competent big body receiver that they can count on. And when you look at what the options are right now, it could ultimately come down to Fulgham and, and JJ. It ultimately depends on what this coaching staff, who is so wide receiver centric, if they feel like they can get something out of JJ and they need a little bit more time, if they see something that they like in him or if it's something that they see with Travis Fulgham that they think that they can unlock uh, his ability to play at that same level that he played last year and uh, and keep him engaged, right? I mean, that's one of the main things with him. you got to keep him engaged. And then you also look at the, the dual ability to play special teams. Who can contribute more in that facet? Uh, I think that Travis Fulgham played, I believe it was 13 snaps last week, and J.J. only played a handful. So you keep an eye on that tonight. You want to see who, who can really make some plays on, in the third phase for Michael Clay. Between Jaw and Fulgham, in your eyes, which of them has the better chance of actually benefiting this team if they make the roster? Travis Fulgham. He's done it before in game situations. J.J. has, has really had standout camps the past two summers but it never really translated onto the into game situations. Whereas when you see, you've seen Fulgham do it against pretty high caliber defenses. Now you have to figure out if you're the Eagles, you have to figure out, was that an outlier or is that, is that, you know, him playing at the at peak performance? Can you get him to play at that performance at that level again? If so, then you keep him on the roster and he very well make the, the initial 53. We'll talk about how that's fluid. They may see someone who sort of shakes free from another team that they prefer and think, and think that they can help the team um, in a more significant way. So uh, he, Travis could also make the team outright and then, and then be subject to waivers and, you know, the next day, if they see somebody else that, that they prefer. Football at four powered by the inside the birds podcast. They would be enjoyed by Andrew Checo at a, the Checo NFL on Twitter. Check out all of his Eagles coverage over at 973 ES. Sorry. The inside the birds.com. Andrew joining us here on 973 ESPN FM. Andrew, when you, when you think about the wide receivers overall, to me, one of the things that stands out is also what happens with tight end because you know, if Ertz is on this team, obviously there's less reps for the back end of the wide receiver depth chart. Whereas if Ertz isn't here, you're going to expect more from the younger players. So is part of the Eagles' decision what they do with wide receiver also impacted by what they do at tight end, knowing that they have Ertz and Goddard, it's a lot different than if Ertz is not here. Yeah, I think so. I think keeping Ertz, you can make a strong case to keep Ertz on the roster because... Hertz and Goddard is a stronger combination than the third receiver or whoever that would be, whether that be Greg Ward, who I believe that that would be right now. And uh, Quez Watkins, I think, will eventually get some reps there as well, and he's going to take on a much larger role as the season sort of unfolds. But right now, Hertz and Goddard present such different matchup issues for defenses, and it enables Jalen Rager and Devontae Smith to be out there out wide, and you sort of spread defenses out and give them so many different looks with that with that different with that personnel and i think that if you keep Ertz on the team you really only need five receivers why keep six receivers just to keep six receivers if you don't have six rosterable players at that position right so i i think if they go five and and they they probably go heavier at tight end because richard rogers has shown that he can be an impactful player when pressed into do in the in the service and then you also have a guy like Jack Stoll, who I'm going to be keeping a close eye on tonight, who has flashed as well and showed some promise, and Tyree Jackson, of course, as well. So you can certainly make a case to keep four tight ends and go heavier there. Also, you mentioned the four tight ends. Does, does that also maybe factor in for maybe some of their goal line plans? Like, obviously, in the goal line situation, you're using a, a much different setup than you would if you were, like, on you know first and 10 at the 50-yard line. Yeah, and uh, and that's where a player, for example, like Jack Stoll, who is a uh, pretty strong blocker, probably the second best blocker in that group behind Dallas Goddard, and those are certain traits that you look for. Now, 
I think that it's going to be determined. I mean, he also can play special teams. Jack played eight snaps last week against the Patriots, and he caught the ball pretty well. Uh, he had seven targets, caught four for 33. So he's a player that I think that has an outside shot to make it. And I don't know if they want to, depending on how he plays tonight, I, I don't know if you want to risk exposing him to waivers. They have two young tight ends who have offered different degrees of promise in Tyree Jackson and, and Jack Stoll. Unfortunately, Tyree got hurt and wasn't able to see his, his summer progress through. But, I mean, the Eagles have really uh, sort of unearthed two, uh, two promising players at the position. You mentioned waivers. Who is a player on offense right now that the, the fans know who they are who could actually make it through waivers if the Eagles decide to go that way? Mm, on offense, I would say probably Coyote. Uh, I would seek the guard from Buffalo and possibly Jason Huntley, the running back. I think he might be able to slip through waivers now. He really hasn't played a ton this summer. He offered uh, some flashes, some glimpses of what he can bring and be to the offense. Uh, but I think that you can get him through waivers and probably stash him on the practice squad and uh, call him up if need be. Um, those are two players right there off the top of my head that I could think of. And you mentioned offensive linemen from Buffalo. Who are you going to keep an eye on tonight with the Eagles' offensive line? Because we know who the starters are. But I think a lot of fans still have questions about the backups because we know that Driscoll and Herbig, we have an idea what they are, but what happens with the backup tackles is a very interesting conversation to me. Yeah, I'll be looking at the Raven Clark. I'll be looking at Brett Toth, and I'll be looking at Coyote Awasika because he's a player that, um, that, that, as an undrafted free agent, I thought that he had a really strong shot to make the roster because – of his versatility. He played left tackle and right tackle Buffalo, shifted into the inside at the pro level, doesn't have the pro typical size to be a, a tackle at the NFL level, but he does have that power and he's able to move people from the inside, uh, has had a strong summer. Um, but now, you know, there's going to be other teams are going to have that game film out there. So it, uh, he might, it, he might be able to latch on as, as one of the final linemen. It depends on how, on how well he performs, but, um, I, I, those are three guys on that offensive line to answer your question that I'll be keeping an eye on. And just flip it over to the defensive side, specifically on the defensive line. Obviously, no Brandon Graham, no Javon Hargrave, no Fletcher Cox, no Barnett, no Sweat, and no Kerrigan tonight. So that means a lot of young guys are going to be getting action in. I'm very curious to see what happens tonight because we saw the Patriots game. It looked like some of those guys were really overwhelmed. So how important tonight is the game and the action for guys like a Teron Jackson or a, uh, a Marlon Tupelotu, guys like that? How important is tonight? Oh, it's, it's enormous for their, for their stocks. I mean, I, don't, I think that their fates have already been sealed because of just how deep they are that – and like I said, I don't know that the final game can really uh, make or break their roster hopes when you they, they've had weeks to evaluate these guys and already two games. So they sort of have an idea of what these guys uh, of what these guys are at this stage of their career. Yeah, you're going to see a lot of Teron Jackson. You're going to see a lot of Marlon Tui Pelotu. You're going to see Raekwon Williams. Uh, Raekwon Williams. Um, uh, Jaquan Bailey. You're going to see a lot of these type of guys out there. Um, but they've been gashed. They make no make no mistake. They've been gashed in the running game. And while I went into the uh, training camp, when I went into when I was evaluating the roster, I thought that Marlon Tweet below two had a decent shot at making the team. But really, does not have NFL level strength right now. Sort of getting bullied by these interior linemen, pushed around in the running game. That that much is evident. I didn't expect that, to see that. Um, but I, I think that he might be best served. Uh, with a year on the practice squad where he can really develop and refine some of his skills. Uh, Teron Jackson, I thought that uh, in the earlier in the preseason, earlier in training camp, he really flashed uh, his motor and, and his power, but uh, he really has not made the impact against the run that I thought that he would, that he has in college. And that's something that has really come to light over the past, uh, especially last week. But 
Um, I think you're starting to see that he might be a player that might not be deemed rosterable on the 53, but might be a, a good practice squad project where he can continue to develop. Now that you're rookie on the defensive line that people have had a lot to say about, a lot of coaches, a lot of players have said a lot of positive things about Milton Williams. What do you expect his role to be for the Eagles this season, and what can he be moving forward? I think he's going to have a big role and he's shown already that the game isn't too big for him, that he, he adjusted to the speed of the NFL pretty remarkable, remarkably. And he has the versatility to play defensive end, defensive tackle. I think he's going to be the number three tackle and he's going to thrive in stunts and different line games that they're going to do twists and really just, he has superhuman strength for being such a young player, uh, good lateral agility, uses his hands extremely well. There's a lot of tools there to like with him. He has a lot of advanced tools for such a young player, and I think you're going to see him utilized in both, in, at both defensive end and defensive tackle uh, pretty early in the season. I think he's going to make uh, have a regular role on defense. Andrew Checo here on Football and Four, powered by the Inside the Birds podcast at A. DeCecco NFL on Twitter. Check out all of his coverage over at InsideTheBirds.com. Andrew, I want to ask you about the linebackers because I believe the assumption at this point is that we know who the two main guys are, Singleton and Wilson, right? But after that, I'm curious to see what happens because there's speculation out there that teams have called the Eagles about Jernard Avery. We know that Patrick Johnson has flashed in joint practices. TJ Edwards looks like he's the best version of himself right now. Sean Bradley looks really good in some of the action. We know that Jacoby Stevens and Davion Taylor, there's a lot of hope for them. They had promise, but both of them got injured. What is your perspective on the linebackers after Wilson and Singleton? Uh, TJ Edwards is the clear-cut number three, in my opinion. I thought that he returned this summer in great shape. He moves a lot better in coverage, uh, and I and you got to give a credit to TJ for working on that area of his game to make himself a more valuable commodity for Jonathan Gannon and find his way to find a role and not just be typecast at that two down run defending thumper, which is what he really was. And he got exposed a little bit in coverage, which limited his usage. So I think that he really took a step forward in his progression. He'll be the number three. And then after that is where it gets very interesting because you have a guy like Sean Bradley who really impressed against the Steelers. He was all over the place. I thought he missed some tackles and over pursued a little bit uh, against the Patriots. Um, you mentioned the two linebackers, Davion Taylor and Jacoby Stevens. Jacoby, they both uh, flashed in the beginning of training camp, but unfortunately both were injured and not able to continue their summers. I think both of those guys make the roster, and then it, it looks like it's going to be Patrick Johnson to, uh, to be that hybrid Sam role for Gannon as that sort of uh, pass rushing uh, edge rusher off the, you know, it's going to be a very unique look for that role. And I think that um, Jannard Avery's nursing uh, groin injury and Joe Osman's no longer here. So by default, uh, Patrick Johnson's got the inside track again, unless they see somebody that they like that sort of shakes free from another team's roster that they think can make a more immediate impact. Andrew, based on your NFL draft analysis and your thoughts on Patrick Johnson, what, what can he be in the NFL? What can he be in this Eagles defense? Uh, well, he's, he's a tweener, Bill. He's uh, two, 6'2", 248. So I think that he's going to be a – it's obviously going to be a situational pass rusher, but he's a very instinctive player, good anticipation, smart guy. But I do think that he can make an impact uh, as in a rotation. And you gotta, he's a guy that you got to keep fresh. You don't want to wear him down. Then they tend to get players of his mold tend to lose their effectiveness if they're overused. But I think you know, keep him on a snap count. He'll, he'll play a long time in this league, um, whether it be this year if he makes the 53, or if he's you know, or next year if he, if he spends this year on the practice squad or ends up somewhere else. But um, I, I liked him at Tulane, and I thought he had a lot of translatable uh, traits. So I mean, now it's all about uh, putting your putting your, your best. Uh, your best stuff on film and contributing on special teams and make the decision tough for the coaches, coaching staff. Andrew, of the guys who are going to play tonight, who among the secondary guys, the corners and the safeties, are squarely on the bubble right now? 
Um, Josiah Scott, I would say, but I, I think he's got uh, he's in fairly good standing because of his ability to play the nickel, which is what his size was always. He's limited to playing the nickel. He's only five eight, but I think having him there allows Avante Maddox to move around and be a movable chess piece for Jonathan Gannon. Uh, you can deploy him in a number of different ways. So it's a luxury to have a guy like Josiah Scott. Also, uh, Elijah Riley, uh, I've mentioned him countless times on on your show. I've written about him. I, I, I like that he plays he played boundary corner in, at Army. His transition to safety at this level really impressed me at the East-West Shrine Bowl. Just 23 years old, good ball skills, smart guy, tough, strong tackler. And, you know, he's cost-effective, but I also think that he can be a – core special teams member for Michael Clay and sort of take over that Rudy Ford type of role. But I think that he offers a little bit more upside as a defender. So he's a guy that I think is squarely on the fringes of the roster right now. And yeah, I, I sort of like his chances. He's going to be vying against veteran Andrew Adams who has 73 games under his belt. And he's also going to be going, um, well, Marcus Epps, I think is, is, has got his spot locked in, but I, I, Elijah Riley has really taken advantage of the increased reps with Kayvon Wallace out, and I think he's going to be one of those guys that may be a dark horse to make the game. Follow him on Twitter at a the Checo NFL with the Eagles' final preseason game tonight. We are just days away from the first 53-man cutdowns for the 2021 NFL season this Tuesday at 4 p.m., and that's when you'll hear Andrew again because Andrew, you will be on this Tuesday. Moments after the first 53 cutdowns happen. So we'll look forward to hearing from you again then. And check out all of his coverage over at InsideTheBirds.com. Andrew, great stuff today. Enjoy the game tonight, and we'll catch you on Tuesday. Sounds good, Josh. Have a good weekend.